Yes, uh, what is my movie sequence break about? My movie is a love triangle between a guy, a girl, and an evil video arcade machine. Uh, it's a story, a Cronenbergian love story, I like to call it. Uh, that's uh, basically about somebody that's stuck in a nostalgic past and uh, is trying to figure out a way to get out of it. Um, and uh, in going through that process, uh, his reality begins to crumble, and he doesn't know what's what anymore, and, uh, and things get slimy and gooey and weird and sexual, and uh, uh, bad things happen to people he loves. Yeah, what were some of my influences on the film, and what did I watch? Um, well, I'm, you know, obviously Cronenberg uh, was a huge influence. I'm, I really love body horror, uh, and especially Cronenberg's early works, because I feel like he is able to do something very special in that he's able to take metaphor and make it, make it flesh, make it real. Uh, and that I think is something that uh, cinema is kind of the, the only place where you can do that. Um, and that was really powerful to me and especially when you're talking about a, uh, basically a guy's, like in my movie, a guy's sexual awakening. Um, that was very important to me to be able to tap into that. Um, I was also really influenced by Ken Russell especially altered states. Uh, you know, I was looking at films that were um, human stories first with then metaphysical science fiction fantasy aspects that inserted themselves into it. I find that uh, horror films and sci-fi films are most effective when you care about the people uh, and, and when it's a story about, about human issues first um, and then you put them in a bizarre situation and they react to that. Uh, we have to care about somebody in order to uh, worry about whether or not this horrible stuff is going to happen to them later, you know? Um, there's a film called Tetsuo's The Iron Man, um, which is another big influence on me. It's totally bonkers, um, but visually really interesting. Uh, a film called Beyond the Black Rainbow. Um, you know, you mentioned Ridley Scott, you know, growing up, obviously Alien uh, was like a milestone for me. Um, uh, the, the film that I would say got me into horror in the first place was probably The Exorcist. Uh, my dad showed me that film when I was like 11 or 12. Uh, way too young to be watching it. Scared the hell out of me. Uh, I didn't sleep at all that night. And I remember thinking as I was lying awake going, okay, I know this isn't real. I know the devil's not coming for me right now. I know that there was a filmmaker that made me feel this way. How did he do it? And I woke up the next day and I watched that movie like four times in a row to try to dissect why I felt the way I felt. And that was really profound for me because as a, you know, as a, as a kid, when you start to unlock this idea that a filmmaker can manipulate people, it's, it's pretty mind blowing. Uh, and so I started devouring horror after that, everything I could, you know, and, and uh, I just find horror to be um, a really powerful genre. Uh, you know, I, I tell people, you know, how often in your daily life do you find yourself thinking of Shakespeare and love? But every time you go to the beach, do you not a little bit think of Jaws? Um, and so that's, that's kind of the, uh, that's kind of where I'm, where I'm coming from with that. Yeah, let's talk about sex and horror films. Uh, you know, it's, it's funny that you ask that question because as an American, um, the American entertainment industry is fairly like puritanical about sex, uh, oftentimes uh, a movie will be, you know, rated uh, mature um, simply because of sex and not, they don't care about the violence, you know, it's about the sex. I've always found that very weird, um, but I think that for me as a film goer, it instills in me this sort of desire to see really transgressive and interesting sex scenes. Um, as a kid, I remember one of the First ones that really got me was uh, the depiction of sex in Rosemary's Baby. Um, you know, I mean, it's the devil having sex with this woman. It's like pretty intense. Um, you know, I think, uh, uh, you know, we, we talk about Cronenberg um, and obviously like his film Dead Ringers um, has a lot of uh, uh, very, you know, uh, sexual material in it. Um, but what's interesting about that is that it's sort of in what they don't show. You know, you see these instruments Right, that you know are supposed to be used for, you know, a semi-sexual purpose, but they're so bizarre that you go, 
what the hell could that be possibly used for? And your mind runs rapid. Um, and then, of course, I think of Videodrome, and I think of, I mean, you have James Woods making out with a television set, and it's totally erotic, and it's totally hot, and you find yourself going, why is this erotic to me? And I don't really know the answer. Um, I think that it's about, partly about admitting that sex is slimy and gooey, and it's kind of weird, and it's a little alien. Um, and I think, I mean, you know, we, we talked about Ridley Scott, an alien, before. I mean, talk about, I mean, it's a, basically a giant phallus that's following Ripley around, uh, you know, and everything's very penetrative in that movie. Uh, you have, you know, tails shooting through people, and you have this, you know, giant elongated head. So I think that in cinema, and especially in horror cinema, um, uh, filmmakers start to find ways of, of talking about sex without actually depicting sex. Uh, and I, I wanted to figure that out. You know, like there's lots of scenes in my film where the character Oz is basically having sex with a machine. And my challenge was how do I, how do I film this in a sexy way with something that's inherently not sexy? Um, and on set, it wasn't sexy at all. <laughs> you know, it's me standing just off camera, you know, saying, yeah, treat that button like a nipple, you know, yeah, squeeze that joystick, you know, and it was the actor's job to translate that into something, uh, something realistic and something truthful, uh, you know, but, but uh, f for me, you know, my, my sort of challenge that I gave myself with sequence break was really to try to, uh, try to depict a lustful, relationship through the use of fluids and slime and, and organic uh, sort of pulsating uh, membranes um, and try to really get at like the alienness of sex um, and how disturbing that can be in contrast to his human relationship which is really a bit more innocent um, and even almost a bit childlike. Yeah. Um, what do I think about the status of genre movies in the world right now? I think that there's a couple of things going on. I think that uh, the movies that are shown in theaters are, they're all very big. You know, you get the Marvel movies, you get the Star Wars movies, um, and then maybe one really big hit indie film that they're trying really hard to get an Oscar for. Um, otherwise, yeah, it's primarily small. It's VOD. Um, I know in the States, I don't know how it goes here in Italy, but in the States uh, we have, you know, limited theatrical runs in very, very small movie theaters where maybe for a week something will play. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm sad about it because I think that, uh, I think that these independent films, one, I'll tell you, every director wants their movie to be seen in a theater. That's the way it's intended. Um, and that's, you know, the way that it sounds best and looks best. So it's saddening that most films won't get seen that way. Um, but at the same time, there's, I think because of the fact that movies can be made for cheaper and cheaper now, and that, and that independent films oftentimes will have a certain amount of freedom as far as their content, that it allows for a lot of really cool, interesting stuff um, to come out that otherwise wouldn't be seen. If a studio were made, you know, a studio would never make Sequence Break, right? You know, a studio would never make, um, you know, It Follows, which was a huge hit in the States, well, a huge, you know, genre hit. Um, a studio would never make The Babadook, you know? Um, so it's cool that now we have this huge boom in independent cinema, which frankly reminds me a lot of the uh, cinema of the 70s. You know, like, where would we be without the Texas Chainsaw Massacre? Where would we be without Night of the Living Dead? These are perfect examples of films that came about completely free of the studio system, were made for cheap, and they resonated because they were good fucking movies. And I, I am a full believer that the cream rises to the top, that, you know, if you make a good film, people will see it, you know, it's like in Field of Dreams, if you build it, they will come. Like, this is, uh, I think, a, a basic truth. Um, and horror fans especially are, are so diehard, they tell you what they like, um, you know, and, and so the real, the challenge becomes, you know, trying to get around things like illegal downloading, 
and in torrenting and stuff like that so that the filmmakers are supported financially so that they can continue to make movies. Because that's all any of us want to do. Um, whether or not it's seen in a the theater, you know, I think there would have to be a major overhaul. I, I, I think that right now it's just so expensive that unless your movie is a gigantic hit, um, you're, it's not going to be in a theater. Uh, you know, I, I think that's all the more reason to support whatever independent art houses you have in your local town. Like, do you have those here in Torino? Yeah, you know, and, and, you know, I think that's all the more reason to go support them, see movies when they're out, uh, because it shows people, yeah, there is money to be made, and money is the master of all things. So, you know, got to support it where you can. Yeah, my experience with retro gaming and why I would make a movie about retro gaming, um, I, I grew up, I was born in 1983. Um, I grew up in a time when arcades were still very much around. Um, uh, in, in the movie, the character Tess actually tells a story that's straight out of my mouth um, about how uh, when I was a kid, uh, we had an arcade in our local movie theater. And when my parents would go and see you know, films that I couldn't go see, I would just stay and play in the arcade the whole time. Uh, this was back when parents would leave their kids alone to just do whatever. And I would just play in the arcade. Uh, same with, we would go to the mall, you know, and my parents would go clothes shopping or something boring like that, so I would just hang out in the arcade. Um, at home, same thing, you know, Nintendo was this new thing. Um, I'd never seen anything like it. And I would, you know, I, I was not an outdoors guy. I was, during the summer, I would stay inside all day and, and play video games. So it was very much a part of my, my childhood. Um, you know, I, I, I talk about how I, I would experience when I was a kid that, that video games were kind of the first time I felt like real like danger. Um, you know, you're playing as Mario and it's up to you to make sure that you get past Bowser. And that might sound so silly right now, but as a kid, I think that's kind of a profound experience. It's sort of the first time that you're really in charge of something. Um, and, uh, and that, you know, your actions have real consequences. Um, and so somehow, for me, there's something very powerful about, about growing up with video games and about the process of playing them um, and, uh, you know, and, and how effective they can be. I mean, honestly, I rarely get scared by a movie nowadays. I'm, I'm a pretty hardened pro at watching horror movies. But playing a horror video game is totally different, and I don't know why that is, you know? And it's something about this connection that you have to the screen. You know, cinema is still a, a, a medium where you sit back and you watch something. It's passive. Um, but then you have games where it's an active expression of you and the game, which is becoming more and more cinematic, really connecting. And so that, to me, was really interesting to think about a guy that is basically his only connection that he's ever had is with machines. And how best to visualize that and to, to make that real is a connection with video games. Uh, yeah, what's, talking about my experience with film festivals, uh, I think film festivals are the best place to see a movie. Um, one, I think if you can ever see a movie in a theater, go see a movie in a theater. And two, the best place to see a movie in a theater is at a film festival. Because one, you're seeing things that nobody's seen yet. You're seeing things that you know, haven't become a part of sort of the cultural lexicon. You know, like by the time you see, I don't know, the new Marvel movie, you basically know what it's about. You know, you basically get it. You know, you understand it. You know, and, and there's something about seeing a movie that, you know, you've never heard of that you go in completely blind and you uh, get to experience it for the first time alongside all these other people that are experiencing it for the first time. And all of you are cinema fans. You know, everybody is there that like has this sort of shared language. It's totally, it's totally unique. Um, and it's, it's honestly the most inspiring thing to me as a filmmaker to go and go to these festivals because you're around people that love all the same stuff you do. Uh, and when else do you get that? You know, you don't have people on their phones the whole time. You don't have people talking or like making fun of stuff on the screen. Uh, you know, I, I don't like going to movies 
in LA because of all those reasons. You have people that aren't, you know, they're there to, for whatever other reason, but not to watch the film. And, and for me, you know, coming to, coming to a film at a film festival, it's, uh, it's totally different. And it, it treats the cinema as a sacred space, uh, which I think for a lot of us, it is. You know, I, I don't go to church, but I go to the movies. Uh, and, and that's what a film festival is like for me. Yeah, uh, do I think that gaming as a section of a film festival is interesting? Uh, yeah, I think it's great. Um, you know, I think that uh, games, you know, not just video games, but games in general are, are obviously a gigantic part of our, of our, you know, shared human culture, right? Like, across all countries, you know, it doesn't matter where you're from. Um, and I think that with as cinematic and as huge as the video game industry especially has gotten over the past, you know, 10 years, uh, it, it's no wonder that more and more I think films are going to start to try to tackle that subject matter. I mean, rather, you know, whether it be like adapting a video game, which one day we'll get a really good one. One day we'll get a really good video game adaptation. We've gotten close on some. I, I, I definitely, you know, like some, but uh, it, it's, they've been pretty hit and miss. Um, but I think, you know, whether it's an adaptation of a video game, whether it's, um, you know, I, I would be really interested to see sort of a, a cross-media experiment of, you know, what if you had a film that somehow worked in conjunction with a game? You know, what happens when there's a bunch of people in a movie theater and they're watching a movie and then at a certain point it comes up and it says, vote on who dies. And everybody gets out their phones and they vote. You know, I, I don't know. Like, Let's, let's experiment and let's explore. And I think that with a film festival like this one, sort of leading the way and saying, yeah, this is a valid uh, way, a valid form of storytelling and a valid uh, outlet for that, um, and highlighting it, uh, that's the only way that it's gonna become, you know, I, I don't know what the word is, uh, mainstream enough to, to, you know, foster that kind of creativity. Yeah, um, talking about practical effects, uh, and especially in regards to the sequence break, um, for me, uh, you know, I, I don't think that like CGI is inherently bad. I think that it can be quite useful as a tool, um, like any other tool to help make a movie, right? But I think that when you're dealing with tactile elements that a character is interacting with, um, it is so vital to have it be something physically there that they can touch, that they can manipulate, that they can, um, you know, that, that you see in camera what it is like a real person, um, you know, like another character. Uh, in Sequence Break, you know, it's, it's absolutely another character in this movie, you know. It, it, the movie wouldn't work if all of a sudden there was like some cartoon like grope in his hand. You know, you've got to see the slime, you've got to really feel it when he squishes it. Um, you know, my, my special effects team, uh, Josh and Sierra Russell, they work on a ton of independent horror films in the States, and I'd worked with them uh, before on several projects, and, and they were the first ones that I went to, and they immediately got it. You know, they read the script, which is really weird, and they said, oh, yeah, we get it, you know, perfect, you know, let, give us a week and come back to us. And so I came back, and they had these drawings that were like, it was amazing. It was like straight out of my head. It, it was a sexualized video arcade machine. Uh, and, and that's so powerful when you meet like another artist and you both have to work together and like, pow, it, it just like meets right in the middle. That's how it was. Um, you know, and then practically how they did it was, you know, we had the arcade machine that we built already and then they just treated it like a human body and they took molds of the console and, and molds of everything so that then they could replace it with silicone that was, you know, organic and that they could, uh, you know, pump air through and excuse me, pump air through and, uh, you know, and, and make move and breathe. Uh, and that was the, uh, you know, that was how we did it. I, I, for me, there was never any question that it needed to be practical. Um, and so we, we put a lot of energy and focus into doing that.